Hello all, and welcome to Stingray Tom's Florida and another Take 5 for Florida History. Today is the ninth part of my series on Florida's official state symbols. I've explored a bunch of the symbols already, all of which can be seen on this playlist. The first of the videos is an introduction to the series. It tells about how Florida creates an official symbol and looks at all the symbols. I'll provide a link to that video at the end, as it's not important to watch before this one. So on to today's topic. I'm excited because I'm exploring my favorite animal on the list of state symbols. The manatee? No, my favorite is the alligator. It's true I like manatees, but the alligator is awesome. I realize that, but today's video is on Florida's official reptile, and that's the American alligator. Alligator Mississippiensis. Florida's legislature chose it in 1987, and it's one of three official reptiles, along with the loggerhead sea turtle and gopher tortoise. The American alligator is one of only two alligator species in the world, the other being the Chinese alligator, which is critically endangered with a wild population of about 300 individuals. The Chinese alligator split apart from the American about 33 million years ago when alligators used a Bering Sea land bridge to move from North America to Asia. Compared to its Chinese counterpart, the American alligator is a healthy population. First listed as an endangered species in 1967, hunting was believed to be decimating its numbers throughout its range. But only 20 years later, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service stated that the population was no longer endangered. The government still regulates the trade of alligators, so as of 2021, it's considered a protected species. There are questions as to whether the alligator needed to be protected through the 1973 Endangered Species Act, however. As of 1973, the estimated population was 734,000. In 1987, that population had grown to around one and a quarter million, and some scientists have argued that it was rebounding before it was ever officially protected. Anyway, its current population is nearly three million, with about one and a quarter million of those in Florida. Let's take a look at the basic information for the gator. And yes, from now on, I'll just use its nickname. And I'm showing photos that I've taken in the wild along with images from old postcards, magazines, and attraction brochures. I've also used photos from a 1962 booklet seen here. The booklet was created with help from the St. Augustine Alligator Farm, Gatorland and its owner Owen Godwin, and Ross Allen and his Reptile Institute located at Silver Springs. It's a fascinating book. In the U.S., the gator is one of two members of Order Crocodilia the other being the American crocodile, which is native only in the extreme southern part of Florida as well as Mexico, Central America, the Caribbean, and northern South America. The gator's range includes all of Florida and Louisiana as well as the southern areas of the rest of the south. While the American crocodile prefers salt water, the gator is found in fresh water with occasional visits to brackish water. They can be found in rivers, lakes, ponds, and swamps anywhere there's enough water for hunting and temperature control. Their direct ancestors appeared in the late Cretaceous era. The first recognizable crocodilian fossils are around 80 million years old. This was the final era of non-avian dinosaurs such as hadrosaurs and tyrannosaurs, which means they survived the latest great extinction event. Gators are probably about 60 million years old. Mature adults can regularly reach 13 feet or 4 meters in length, certainly massive, but considering Australian saltwater crocodiles can reach 20 feet or 6 meters long, it's not the largest species. Larger gators can reach nearly 15 feet. Female gators only reach about 10 feet or 3 meters in length, so the largest are male. 
Male gators are also fairly heavy, weighing up to 1,000 pounds or 453 kilograms, with females correspondingly lighter. Gators continue to grow throughout their lives, so the older a gator is, the larger it is. Gators in captivity don't reach their full length more quickly than their wild counterparts, but on average they are heavier due to the easy availability of food. However, this isn't meant to imply that captive gators are overfed. There is no consensus as to the largest gator on record. People like to talk about 18 or 19 footers, but there's little scientific evidence to support those lengths. Much like record lengths, record ages are hard to pin down. There are a few documented cases of gators that have reached their 80s, and some alligator farms say their oldest specimens are in the 60s or 70s. While these are fairly reliable, farms have also been confused as to the age of their gators in the past. See the caption on this postcard from the St. Augustine Alligator Farm that claims a gator could be 900 years old. I've also seen a 1950s newspaper article from Sanford that suggested the age of a recently captured gator given to the Sanford Municipal Zoo to be up to 500 years. Still, gators are long-lived. They face few threats in the wild. Hatchlings can be snatched by herons, egrets, bald eagles, and hawks, and wild boars and dogs can even grab them along the shore, but it's not long before they grow large enough that there's no natural predators left. Essentially, humans and other gators are their only real danger. It's not uncommon for a male gator to attack and kill another male in a territorial dispute. Plus, both humans and gators are fans of gator meat. Gators reach sexual maturity at around 6 feet or 2 meters in length. It takes about 8 to 12 years for males to reach that size and 10 to 15 years for females. Courtship begins in April and mating occurs as late as June. Gators are not generally social animals, but during mating season they necessarily gather in large numbers for group courtship. Gators are some of the most vocal non-avian reptiles. They are able to use the vocal folds of their larynx to make some impressive calls. They use distinct calls to declare their territory, threaten other gators, and look for mates. Hatchlings perform a yelping sound that tells mom they've hatched and need to be dug out of the nest. They can also call to mom if they're being threatened. Apart from vocalizations, adult gators can produce a dramatic sound known as bellowing. The sound is created by loudly inhaling and exhaling large amounts of air in and out of their lungs. The deep tone bellows or roars are created to attract mates and to establish territory and dominance. The sound of the bellows can be quite loud and they carry well over water. While much of the sound generated is in frequencies that humans can hear, part of the call generated is infrasound, below human hearing range. Beyond the sound, bellowing has a secondary effect, something called a water dance as can be seen in the following video clip from Payne's Prairie Preserve State Park. The rapid exhalation of air from the lungs creates sound waves that vibrate the water around the gator's chest, making it dance. As you can see, this 10 foot long gator is in the head oblique, tail arched posture, and when filling with air, its torso rises up, partially due to increased flotation, but also due to the gator going rigid along its length. While this behavior can happen at any time of day, it's at night when the large choruses of bellowing from both females and males occur. Oddly enough, it's been shown that gators bellow in B flat at a frequency of 58.27 Hz, the equivalent to the lowest B-flat on a piano. After successfully mating, females build a nest in shallow water that's made up of soil, plant material, and other debris. The nest is placed above the usual high water mark. In the nest they lay as many as 45 eggs. The eggs are buried within the nest to moderate their temperature. The sex of the offspring is determined by the internal temperature of the nest. 
Below 87 degrees Fahrenheit, the hatchlings will be female. Above 93 degrees, the clutch will be all male. In between those extremes, the sex is usually heavily weighted towards females. Hatchlings appear from the eggs in a little over two months, from mid-August to early September. About a third of nests are destroyed by flooding or predation, typically raccoons. As mentioned before, hatchlings face a good deal of danger even from older gators who have little problem with cannibalism. Of 100 eggs laid, only 10% will hatch and survive for at least a year. Maybe 5% will reach maturity. Gators have up to 80 teeth. As a gator grows, its teeth and jaws change shape. A gator can replace its teeth regularly throughout its life. They can go through two to 3,000 over a few decades. Juveniles have teeth that are needle-like to capture small prey such as minnows, tadpoles, and bugs. Larger gators develop the conical teeth that make up an adult gator's smile. Gators don't chew their food, so teeth are used for holding on to prey. If the prey is small enough, they're used to help to direct it into the throat. If prey is too large to swallow whole, teeth are used with the bite force to rip off chunks of flesh and limbs, but more on that in a bit. Speaking of bite force, studies have shown that the gator has the strongest bite of any living animal. This has been tested in laboratory studies, and it even exceeds the force generated by larger crocodilians. They have remarkably powerful muscles that close the jaws, though the ones used to open them are comparatively weak. This is why gator handlers can use basic electrical tape to keep their jaws shut. New research suggests that gators have a second joint in the jaw that even helps to lock the mouth to help hold on to prey. Still, gator moms can control their jaws to allow them to safely carry their eggs and hatchlings. Considering its bite force, it should come as no surprise that gators are apex predators, simply meaning that they are at the top of the food chain. Being semi-aquatic, fish are their primary food source, and they are able to hunt them in the water and from the shore. Still, gators will eat just about any wild animal it can kill. New evidence shows that they even hunt for sharks and rays. Depending on the size of the gator, anything that swims or comes to drink water is vulnerable. Beyond that, gators are quite willing to hunt on land as well. Gators have been seen hunting birds and mammals as small as rats and otters, and as large as white-tailed deer and wild boars. Terrestrial hunting usually occurs on warm nights when it's better to stalk their prey. Also, while they're not particularly bothered by living in water near human development, many humans are bothered by them. Considering that gators are willing to eat cats, dogs, and even children, local and state governments have programs to remove most gators from developed areas. By the way, those removed gators, unfortunately referred to as nuisance animals, are often taken to alligator farms to live out their lives. And back to its bite force because, of course, bite force. Large gators are capable of breaking mammal bones and piercing or crushing turtle shells. Once a gator grabs large prey, there's a couple of things that can happen. The first is that the gator can viciously shake its head back and forth, which often kills the victim by breaking its neck. The other behavior is something called a death roll. In order to rip off smaller portions of the animal, Gators can repeatedly spin their entire body while holding on to the prey with their jaws. The gator tucks its legs in to protect them, and then it uses its massive tail to force its body into a high-speed spin. As can be deduced in these photos of a wild gator that's missing its lower arm, this level of injury isn't exactly life-threatening. Reptiles can survive injuries that would typically result in major blood loss and death in mammals and birds. Almost certainly, this gator had its arm bitten off by another gator. Eventually, the arm will heal, assuming infection doesn't set in. It's not uncommon to find gators that have survived major injuries like this. Here's another huge gator with a newly amputated rear toe. Look on the far left of the photo. The toe is there. While it's an inexact term, gators are cold-blooded. The more appropriate term is ectothermic, in that they regulate their body temperature with external sources rather than internal. 
Mammals and birds produce their own body heat, which has advantages, but it requires a great deal more food. Gators control their temperature by moving from sun to shade to water. That's why on cool days, especially in the morning, you will find gators basking in the sun. They generally need to maintain an internal temperature between 77 and 95 degrees Fahrenheit, though they can survive colder temperatures for short periods of time. Gators are one of the more adaptable crocodilian species when it comes to ranges of temperature, surviving submerged in water when the air temperature is below freezing. Implanted thermometers in some gators have shown that they can survive internal temperatures as low as 41 degrees Fahrenheit and end up showing no ill effects. When the outside temperature is too hot, gators not only cool themselves in water, but while on land they can open their mouths in a process called gaping. This provides cooling by evaporation from the lining of the mouth. In winter, gators all but stop eating, and while it's common to think of gators as particularly voracious eaters, even in the heat of the year they consume very little. A gator that weighs the same as a tiger will do well on less than one-fifth of the calories a tiger requires. Mature ones can survive for about six months without eating. Digestion turns most of the calories to fat, which they can rely on for energy for days or weeks. There are two kinds of white gators, albino and leucistic. Both are exceedingly rare in the wild as a gator's coloration is highly important to its survival. Hatchlings that are white are almost certainly going to be eaten by something, and if somehow a white gator was able to survive to adulthood, it would find its coloration a limitation while hunting. White gators are found in captivity as they are protected from the time they hatch. They are bred in order to repeat their coloration. So while the conditions are rare, it's not unusual to see examples in alligator farms and zoos. Albino gators lack any pigmentation, which results in white scales and pink eyes. Leucistic gators have a partial loss of pigmentation. Most commonly, they also have white scales, though some of them can have a bluish tint to their scales, as do their eyes. Much like the dolphin, which I'll cover in this video, gators have had a huge impact on Florida tourism well beyond seeing them in the wild. One of the first types of attractions developed in Florida was the alligator farm. These were, and still are, facilities that collect and display gators and other reptiles, such as crocodiles, turtles, tortoises, and snakes. The fact that they were referred to as farms implies that at least some were also in the business of selling gators, gator meat, and gator skins. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, alligator farms stocked their ponds with gators captured from the wild, either by collecting and hatching eggs or by capturing gators. Gator hunters would try to capture the largest they could handle with the rudimentary tools and skills that they had. Gators were so plentiful in the wild, farms were not interested in breeding them in-house. While there's not a lot of information about alligator farms before the 20th century, we can see that they appeared to fill their farms with as many gators as possible, conditions that modern alligator farms don't practice. This overcrowding and the lack of appropriate nest-making material meant that gators weren't likely to breed. It wasn't until the 1960s, when wild gators became harder to collect, that farms began to develop breeding procedures. Though in truth, the farms that operated as tourist attractions weren't the ones who began actively breeding. That was reserved for substantial operations that handled much larger numbers of gators that can be found in most attractions. I'll be doing a video on alligator farms in the near future, so I won't cover the history of specific ones here. There are several located throughout the state. Arguably, the two largest are the St. Augustine Alligator Farm, which opened in 1893 and is the oldest alligator farm and zoo operating in the state, and Gatorland, located between Orlando and Kissimmee. It opened in 1949. I've included its history in a recent video. As for seeing them in the wild, that's certainly not hard to do. If you want to avoid any form of hiking, check out some of the airboat tours. They all promise gator sightings. For getting up close and personal, check out this list of parks. All the gators in this video are from these sites. There are many more parks with gators, of course. If you do go out in the wild, either by boat or foot, there's ways of improving your chances to see gators. 
Remember what I said about gators being ectothermic? Your best bet to see gators out of the water is to explore in the morning on sunny days. On cooler days, they'll bask on the shore much longer as they need to get their body temperature up after a cool night. Also visit parks during the spring breeding season. While much of the breeding activity happens at night, gators will all be hanging out closer together during the day. And if you want to see hatchlings, autumn is the time to see them. For them, I'd suggest contacting some airboat tours near you to see if they visit gator nests on their tours. By the way, postcard makers found gators and bathing beauties a popular combination, as can be seen here. And as for a last bit of random trivia, the comment on this postcard is a reference to a popular cigarette ad campaign which ran between 1963 and 1981. The original slogan was, us Tarrington smokers would rather fight than switch. It's a slogan that appeared in ads for Tarrington cigarettes because the only thing better than cancer is violence. So that wraps it up on Florida's official state reptile and its bite force, death roll, and water dancing. There are many myths and misconceptions about this ancient animal, so I hope I have been able to provide some useful information. And I hope that clears up what my favorite animal is. Well, yeah. Anyway, thanks for watching another of my videos. Please like and subscribe to the channel to learn more about Florida tourism history. Stingray Tom's Florida, traveling through time around the Sunshine State.